uh, Paskaracharya. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Som Shekhar. I'm a student at uh, the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, and this is a problem which I have been working on under the guidance of my advisor, uh, Uday Bondukula from the Indian Institute of Science and Albert Cohen from ENS Paris, India. So firstly, when we consider this problem of storage optimization, uh, the basic goal is to try and reuse memory locations as far as possible. And obviously, this can only be done uh, if the corresponding values do not have overlapping lifetimes. The reuse itself could be within the same array, or it could be across different arrays. Uh, but regardless of the nature of reuse, efficient storage management is quite crucial for data intensive programs, because when we have a fixed amount of main memory, uh, a significant reduction in the storage requirements will help us run larger problem sizes. And some example applications where this would be beneficial are stencil computations, uh, image processing pipelines, especially when these are specified using a high-level domain-specific language. And the class of programs that we are interested in in this work are uh, called affine loopness. These are basically loopness where uh, the loop bounds and array axis are affine functions of uh, the surrounding loop iterators and program parameters. So let's look at a couple of examples to understand the problem better. Uh, Here's a time iterated 1D stencil, which has been implemented to use uh, n square storage. A t i depends on A t minus 1 i plus 1. It depends on A t minus 1 i, and it also depends on A t minus 1 i minus 1. And this gives us the dependence vectors 1 minus 1, 1 0, and 1 1. So the result of this computation, or the live out, uh, is basically the final row of the array that is computed. And because every row is computed as a function of the previous row, an obvious way to contract this array is to reduce it to just two rows of size n each, as shown here. So you will have a modulo 2 axis uh, every time you perform an array axis. Uh, but is this the optimal storage requirement for this computation? Uh, it so happens that it isn't, because at any point during the execution of this program, uh, there are at most n plus 1 values that are live. And there happens to be uh, a way uh, to contract this two-dimensional n cross n array to just a one-dimensional array of size n plus 1. Uh, and as you can see here in the figure C, uh, this requires us to use a very complicated array access function. And this is very hard to figure out manually, although this is a, uh, this is a storage optimal uh, solution. So our work is basically uh, facilitating us to derive such uh, modulo storage mappings automatically. So that was an example of intra-array reuse. Here, here's an example of uh, an image processing pipeline where there is some scope for inter-array reuse, that is reuse across different arrays. Uh, this is basically a sequence of loop nests. Uh, each loop nest is applying a stencil. And the arrays A0 and A1 written by the statements S0 and S1 are just temporary buffers. And they can be dispensed with as long as the result of the computation uh, is available in the array A2 at the end of the computation. And we can do this by using the storage mappings shown here. Uh, again, this is hard to deduce manually. Don't bother examining them in detail. Uh, the thing to note here is that if we use these storage mappings, all the statements S1, S0, S1, and S2 will be writing to the same array A, which is, uh, which is an N cross, N, N plus 2 cross N array. So effectively, we would have reduced the overall storage requirement from 3N square uh, to N square plus 2N. First, let's consider the problem of intra-array storage optimization. Uh, the general approach to this problem is to essentially contract uh, a given array along multiple directions to fix sizes. Uh, now, the problem of minimizing, minimizing the array size along a given set of directions has already been well studied by Lefebvre and Fortier. Uh, but the problem of finding good directions along which to contract the array uh, still does not have very good heuristics. So most of the uh, uh, existing approaches either assume that the directions have already been uh, provided by some oracle, or they assume that uh, uh, the array has to be contracted along the canonical directions, that is, uh, the original dimensions of the array. Now, these canonical directions uh, need not always be the good ones for contracting the array. Uh, and the choice of directions is uh, extremely important because it affects both the dimensionality and the storage size. And it can actually be the difference between uh, contracting an n cross n array uh, to an n square or 2n or n plus 1 storage. So our work is basically aimed at finding such good directions uh, while simultaneously contracting the uh, array along them. So let me explain uh, how we do this. Uh, so basically, we do this by finding something uh, called the storage partitioning hyperplane. This hyperplane is indicative of the direction along which the array needs to be contracted. And uh, the definition is that 
uh, this hyperplane uh, partitions the array, uh, partitions the iteration space such that each partition uses a single memory location. So to understand this process of partitioning better, here's an example of an n cross n array space. Now imagine the hyperplane minus one one sweeping through this array space. You will see that it creates two n minus one partitions. So the blue dotted lines shown here basically ref uh, uh, rep represent the partitions that I'm referring to. And now the problem of finding good directions is nothing but uh, finding uh, storage partitioning hyperplanes with the right orientations. And contracting the array uh, is pretty much the same as minimizing the number of partitions created by the storage hyperplanes. Now often it may not be enough to find just one storage hyperplane. We may have to partition the array space uh, successively until a certain criterion is met, uh, in which case the dimensionality of the final storage mapping uh, will be equal to the number of storage hyperplanes that we need to find. So our array space partitioning approach is based on the notion of conflict satisfaction. So firstly, let me explain what we mean by conflicts within an array space. Consider two indices, i and j, within an array space. Uh, we say that these two indices conflict with each other uh, if the corresponding array elements are simultaneously live. That is, if they have overlapping lifetimes. Uh, to give you an example, here's a, a, a loop computing the nth Fibonacci number. And clearly, Fib i and Fib i minus 1 are simultaneously live. They, uh, their lifetimes overlap. Uh, so we say that the index i conflicts with the index i minus 1. That is the, uh, the conflict relation shown in red there. Now the length of this conflict, or uh, the difference between the conflicting indices, is equal to 1. And from this we can infer uh, that the 1D array uh, used for computing the nth Fibonacci number can be contracted to just two sets. And the resulting modulo storage mapping is as shown here, Fib i being mapped to Fib i mod 2. So essentially, we'll be performing a modulo 2 operation as part of every array access. Now, this is a very simple example. Uh, when, the, when we have higher dimensional array uh, spaces, uh, the set of conflicts, conflicts can be slightly more complicated. Here's a producer-consumer loop nest, uh, where there are some flow dependencies, 1, 0, 0, 1, which, which is shown by the maroon arrows in the second figure there. And the live out portion is also uh, slightly odd, uh, that is, the live out is essentially the portion of the array that has a pending uh, read at the end of the computation. Uh, and here, the top row and the rightmost column of uh, the array A uh, are live out. So as a result, we have a, a conflict search uh, which, which can be rep mathematically represented as a union of con convex polyhedra. Here we show a geometric representation in the rightmost figure. Uh, so the double-edged arrows in the right, uh, rightmost figure represent the conflicts, and the endpoints of those arrows uh, represent the conflicting indices. Uh, here the union is made up of three convex polyhedra. That's why we have three different colors. Uh, conflicts belonging to the same color uh, belong to the same conflict uh, polyhedra. Now, we say that a conflict uh, is satisfied by a hyperplane uh, if the hyperplane maps the conflicting indices to different partitions. So consider the conflict between i and j. And now suppose it is satisfied by the hyperplane gamma. Uh, suppose i is mapped to the partition gamma dot i and j is mapped to the partition gamma dot j. The two partitions should not be the same. So I won't get into the details of our heuristic for finding storage partitioning hyperplanes. Uh, it probably suffices to say that it is driven by a dual objective function. The primary objective is to maximize conflict satisfaction because fewer will be the uh, number of conflicts that remain unsatisfied, fewer will be the number of storage hyperplanes that we need to find, and therefore lower will be the dimensionality of the storage mapping. And our secondary objective is to minimize the number of partitions created by the storage hyperplane because this directly correlates with the size of the contracted array uh, in the eventual storage mapping. Now if, the, if we use, these, uh, use this heuristic, we'll see that uh, the candidate hyperplanes uh, that is, the canonical hyperplanes are no good because they cannot satisfy all the conflicts. However, there are several other hyperplanes like minus 1, 1, minus 2, 1, and minus 3, 1, which can satisfy all the conflicts at once. Among these, our heuristic chooses minus 1, 1 because it satisfies all the conflicts uh, with the least number of partitions. In this case, it's 2n minus 1. So if you examine the figure on the right, uh, you will see that the hyperplane minus 1, 1 is satisfying all the conflicts. Take, a, take the blue conflict, you'll see that the endpoints lie in different partitions, and the same holds for the red and the green ones. So the final modulus st storage mapping is shown here. A T i is mapped to A i minus T mod 2 n minus 1. Uh, it happens to be both storage as well as dimension optimal. 
And i minus t here is basically the dot product of ti and minus 1, 1. And uh, 2n minus 1 is basically due to the 2n minus 1 partitions that are being created by the storage hyperplane that we just formed. Now, when there are multiple statements within an affine loop nest, uh, there may be some scope for storage reuse across different statements. Uh, so the typical approach here is to decouple, decouple the problem of inter-array reuse uh, from that of intra-array reuse. Uh, basically, as a first step, each individual array is contracted separately. And thereafter, uh, an array interference graph is constructed to exploit the inter-array reuse opportunities. So in this array interference graph, each node represents a statement. And an edge between two statements basically implies that the corresponding arrays interfere with each other. That is, they have overlapping lifetimes. So when we do a greedy coloring of this array interference graph, uh, we can conclude that statements with the same color uh, can write to the same data structure. So to give you an example, here's a 1D stencil, uh, which has been implemented in ping pong fashion using two buffers, P and Q. P is computed as a function of Q, and then it is copied back to Q so that Q can be used again for computing the next set of values for P. So the arrays P and Q have already been contracted uh, to size n, and the overall storage requirement is 2n. It's not clear if uh, this storage requirement can be reduced even further. So if we build the array interference graph for this, we see that Pi and Qi are simultaneously live. And so we have this graph where uh, you have two nodes representing the two statements, and there is an edge between them showing the interference between the two arrays. And on graph coloring, clearly the two uh, statements will get different colors, which means that they cannot write to the same data structure. So effectively, the, we haven't been able to reduce, it, reduce the storage requirement further. However, uh, there exists a modular storage mapping shown here, uh, which, if used, uh, would cause the statement, both the statements to write to the same array A, uh, which is of size n plus 1. And this means that there is some scope for inter-array reuse, which is not being exploited by this decoupled approach. So what we need is a unified approach, uh, which will be able to exploit not just the intra-array reuse opportunities, but also the inter-array reuse, op reuse opportunities. And such a unified approach is possible uh, if we deal with a global unified array space uh, instead of treating each array separately. And we go about building such a unified array space by first converting the given affine loop nest uh, to a single assignment form so that each statement will write to its own local array space. And then we unify these local array spaces into a d plus 1 dimensional global array space where d is the maximum dimensionality of all the locally, local array spaces that we just created. So if we convert this ping pong style 1D stencil to the single assignment form with a global array space, this is how it will look as in the figure B. Uh, both the statements S0 and S1 write to the same array A. Uh, it's a three dimensional array. And, uh, uh, the outermost dimension is basically used to disambiguate uh, between the local array spaces. S0 writes to A0, and S1 writes to A1. Right. So uh, in order to exploit the intra-array reuse opportunities, all we need is uh, to specify the intra-statement conflicts. That is, conflicts uh, where the indices lie within the same local array space. But the global array space actually enables us to specify interstatement conflicts as well. That is, conflicts where the indices lie in different array spaces. They span multiple local array spaces. Uh, so in this case, there is a flow dependence between S1 and S0. And as a result, you have both intrastatement and interstatement conflicts that are shown in figure C. The green conflicts represent the intrastatement conflicts, and the red ones represent the interstatement conflicts. So in the context of such a global array space, uh, partitioning it uh, essentially means that we have to find storage hyperplanes for each statement separately. And in this case, the hyperplane will not be characterized only by its normal, but also by its offset, because the offset indicates uh, a, a constant shift of uh, the local array spaces uh, relative to the other local array spaces. And that can often enable uh, inter-array reuse. So the conflicts satisfaction uh, condition is also slightly modified here uh, because uh, we, we are representing the hyperplane not just by the normal, but also by its offset. And furthermore, multiple hyperplanes may be involved uh, when, uh, we, when we are dealing with an interstatement conflict. So suppose you have a conflict between i and j, and it is satisfied by the hyperplanes gamma s and gamma t. 
uh, with their corresponding offsets. Uh, now, if i is mapped to the partition gamma s dot i plus delta s, and j is mapped to the partition gamma t plus delta t, the two partitions should, again, not be the same. Uh, so the same principle holds. Uh, the conflicting indices have to be mapped to different partitions in order uh, for them to be satisfied. So the global conflict set uh, can also be expressed as a union of uh, convex polyhedra. Some of these polyhedra represent only the intrastatement conflicts, and the rest of them uh, will represent all the interstatement conflicts. With this as the input, we need to find a storage hyperplane for each statement. And as I said, one storage hyperplane may not be enough to satisfy all the conflicts, so we end up partitioning the global array space iteratively uh, to, let's say, find m partitioning hyperplanes with their corresponding offsets. And at the end of this iterative partitioning of the global array space, all the conflicts have to be satisfied. An intrastatement conflict associated with a statement uh, will have to be satisfied by at least one of the hyperplanes found for that statement. And an interstatement conflict associated with two statements will have to be satisfied by a pair of hyperplanes found at the same level. Now, because we partition the array space iteratively, the global array space iterati iteratively, uh, any interstatement conflict will have to be satisfied by hyperplanes found during the same iteration. It can't be uh, between hyperplanes found in different iterations. So here's a high-level overview of our integrated heuristic for exploiting both intra-array and inter-array use. Uh, so the objectives, uh, it's a four-fold objective. Uh, the primary and the secondary objective pretty much echo back to the objectives that we use for uh, exploiting intra-array reuse. So the first objective is to maximize intrastatement conflict satisfaction. And the second objective is to minimize the number of partitions uh, created in this process. Now, the principle here is still the same, the globe, except that we are now partitioning the global array space. And we are doing this by first, uh, by almost as though we are contracting each local array space separately, independent of each other. And despite that, we can still satisfy interstatement conflicts. But this will be a side effects, and the objectives uh, three and four are focused on this. So third objective is to maximize interstatement conflict satisfaction, and the fourth objective is to minimize the number of partitions created in this process. So here we are actually trying to, uh, there is no real urgent urgency to satisfy the interstatement conflicts. Uh, so one of one particular, uh, particularly interesting case is when uh, all the interstatement conflicts are satisfied as side effects, and there is no need to find hyperplanes uh, exclusively sat for satisfying the interstatement conflicts. So again, uh, once uh, the storage hyperplanes have been found uh, with these objectives, there may still remain some conflicts which are not satisfied. So we remove them from the conflict set and then iterate again using the revised conflict set. So using this heuristic, we can see that the canonical hyperplanes 0, 0, 001 and 0, 010 0 again uh, are not good because uh, they, can, they either satisfy only the intrastatement conflicts or the interstatement conflicts. But there are other hyperplanes like 0, minus 1, 1, 0, minus 2, 1, and 0, minus 3, 1 which can satisfy all conflicts. And 0 minus 1, 1 happens to be the uh, solution chosen by our heuristic uh, because it creates the least number of partitions, n plus 1. And in this case, the same storage hyperplane uh, happens to be found for both the statements. So we get the same modulo storage mapping for both the statements, uh, a, j, t, i being mapped to a, i minus t mod n plus 1. And uh, a curious thing here is that with this modulo storage mapping, uh, statement one will become a redundant copy statement because the left-hand side and the right-hand side uh, end up being the same. Okay, for the sake of experimental evaluation, we uh, basically implemented these uh, heuristics into a polyhedral storage optimizer called SMO, and we compared the storage mappings obtained using our tool against the baseline technique of Lefebvre and Fortier, uh, and uh, this was over benchmarks which consisted of uh, representative programs from stencil computations and uh, Jacobi uh, smoothing stages from uh, multigrid methods and also some image processing pipelines like blur filter and unshaft mask. And in all the benchmarks, we noticed that uh, there was an overall storage uh, uh, re reduction uh, uh, by a factor two. In case of the stencil computations and uh, the Jacobi smoothing benchmark, uh, it was because of an increase in interstatement reuse. And in case of the uh, blur filter and unsharp mask benchmarks, 
it was because of an increase in the intrastate military use. And although some of the techniques uh, that were used uh, for uh, obtaining these storage mappings, such as Fourier mod skin elimination and uh, uh, integer linear programming, have worst case exponential comp complexities, we see that the time taken to obtain these mappings shown in the rightmost column is quite tolerable in practice. Uh, and the h relatively higher time required to compute the storage mapping for 3D stencil is because of a large number of uh, convex polyhedra that are involved in this uh, particular benchmark and the higher uh, dimensionality of uh, this particular array space. And uh, this is the burning question, what are the implications on performance? Uh, it's very hard to characterize the performance based on just the storage reduction factor. Uh, so we ran uh, some of these benchmarks, or all of these benchmarks with different problem sizes on an Intel Xeon uh, dual socket machine with eight cores. And these were compiled using the Intel C compiler with the flags minus O3 and minus OpenMP. Uh, and in most cases, we noticed that uh, the performance was pretty much comparable uh, to what we would get uh, using the baseline storage mapping, uh, except in case of the 3D stencil uh, ping pong benchmark where there is some slowdown. Uh, this can be attributed to the relatively uh, complex modular storage mapping that we obtained for uh, this particular benchmark. So to summarize, uh, we have been able to generalize the approach of uh, array space partitioning that we had developed for intra-array reuse uh, to the inter-array reuse problem as well. Uh, except that in this case, we are iteratively partitioning the global array space instead of treating each local space individually, and that helps us to find uh, better storage mappings than uh, some of the existing techniques. And the heuristic that we developed for this uh, is driven by a fourfold objective function, uh, which impacts dimensionality and also minimizes dimension sizes by greedily satisfying the conflicts and minimizing the number of partitions created in the process. And it also factors in uh, the role of the interstatement conflicts uh, in exploiting uh, the interstatement reuse opportunities. And finally, we have implemented uh, all of these heuristics into a polyhedral storage optimizer called SMO, and we have seen that it's quite effective on uh, some real-world examples, and uh, the storage mappings that we obtain are the same or better than uh, many of the existing techniques. Finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the support provided by INRIA and National Instruments. Uh, thank you. That's all I have. So obviously, you know, you'd like to get the run times to go down. Can, do you have a, a good explanation? Because usually reducing space would reduce run time. But it, do these more complex indexing mean that you're not quite getting cache performance the way that you would with a you know, just linear you know, walk through the array? Yeah, I mean, as I said, it's actually very hard to characterize based on just the reduction factor. Uh, the modulo uh, operation is certainly one aspect that needs to be looked into. And there are also other things like vectorization opportunities uh, which may be hampered by the use of such uh, modulo operations. It may be obfuscated for the compiler uh, to reason about uh, vectors. Yes. What are in conflict the objectives? Actually, no. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, the ordering has uh, a certain rationale behind it. Uh, as I said, the first two objectives are based, uh, they are mainly focused on uh, contracting the local array spaces. And there is no real hurry to satisfy the interstatement conflicts. You can always satisfy them trivially by uh, going for the outermost canonical hyperplane. Uh, I mean, just because you satisfy an interstatement uh, conflict does not mean that you have achieved interstatement reuse. So you can always delay it, and that's why we try to satisfy them as side effects. And in, in, in a very interesting case, we will not have to find a storage hyperplane for exclusively satisfying the interstate conflict.